What time did you get here? Um, I actually picked up something uh, in Dallas, and uh-huh. then I came over and uh, went to a gas station and did some work there. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, thank you for showing up on time. Yeah. I'm sorry I was busy. No, no, no problem. Show up on time. <laughs> um, so this is pretty much, you know, just sitting down with leaders and, okay. you know, people with high titles and in hopes of guiding others, you know, kind of a pathway for them. So that way they know kind of, you know, what other people go through, what okay. obstacles, what adversaries. So that way they could kind of relate and help them move forward, you know. Okay. So you're a operations manager, manager right? It's it's a it's a moving title. A moving title. Yeah, right now they're in the process of redoing the titles for our company. Uh huh. Um, since uh, the new company that acquired us um, wants to get a clear view of who's doing what and and mm. what that means, you know, to the title. But right now it is operations manager. Um, and um, as far as what I cover, I cover the whole U.S. I mean, if uh, if we're branching out to Canada right now, I would be that guy. So you would have if to go to Canada. I would have to go to Canada. Really? If they're branching out to Mexico, which we've tried a couple of times, and I what would happened be that there? guy. And it's just uh, a lot of the uh, paperwork and the legalities of it. Uh, we want to make sure we're on the right, right path, and it's just it's not there. So. And you guys do mostly security, right? We mostly do security solutions. Um, surveillance solutions for um, commercial construction very little private very little residential uh, but uh, big corporations they, they come to us and you know they say hey I have this weird um, asset weird location and you know we design something that they can they can see every day and that we can monitor every mm-hmm. day so. and um, so if you were to go to Canada, how, do you have to go there for training all the employees? Or so the thing is with Canada, it's, it's weird right now because uh, the um, um, our uh, acquired uh, our acquiring company, Garda World, uh, and if we, if we can say names, yeah, right? you can yeah. say names. Up to you. Um, so Garda World is a is a global company, and they're um, based in Montreal, mm. uh, Canada. So. They're definitely going to want to expand to Canada. So um, in here in the coming years, we're going to have to, uh, even with all the legalities, now that we have an entity in Canada, it's, I think it's going to be easier uh, transporting goods and obviously um, going out there and training and making a new branch that'll work like we know we can work, but in Canada, you mm-hmm. know, with all the Canada rules as far as employment and people and hours and whatnot. Um, so it's it's gonna be fun. I mean, I've, I've always wanted to go. As a matter of fact, you've never uh, gone to Canada. I've never gone. Really, you know, we have jobs that were very close, like a hundred, yeah, about a hundred miles out from the border. And I always kept uh, telling my family, <laughs> "I want to go. I want to go." And I never, I never go. It just mm. happens. I, I just finish the work that I need to do and I come back. Right. So yeah. yeah. So have you got? Have you needed to go to Mexico? Because you say that you. Um, there's been a lot of talk, so we do, uh, or we did, and you know, now it's probably going to be less, but we used to do a lot of trade shows, different, you know, variations of where our uh, services could be, um, you know, presented, and we had people from all over the world. We had people asking about our products in uh, Africa, in Middle East, in Mexico, in, uh, what was it, Chile, mm-hmm. um, Central America, uh, and in Canada. Uh, and we have one um, person that usually goes to the trade shows. Her name is Lisa, and she is Canadian, so she would always have that relationship. But when it came down to, hey, could we take it to Canada? We would say we can take it as far as the border, and then you know, you, then you transfer it. You know, however you transfer your normal goods, and, um, and then use it in Canada. And it'd be the same thing with Mexico. We sell it to you here in the U.S., and then you decide what to do or how to actually transport it. And do you guys get to see, like, live footage? We always, 99% of the time, we see live footage. Mm. Um, and why that is is because we also do the monitoring part. So our company not only supplies the hardware, the setup, the training, but they also do the monitoring. So whenever something happens uh, at 3 a.m. in the morning, uh, it's us that are getting all the video analytics and the triggers and then acting 
wow. you know, on that. And I don't say us by me, but I mean, we have a, a group dedicated and certified, you know, cert, uh, UL certification for the, for the monitoring station that we have. So how it's, crazy it's really, things, good, really cool. How crazy do things get in Mexico? Um, well, in Mexico, we haven't had a live monitoring. All we do the monitoring is, is for the U.S. We, oh, haven't, okay. we haven't a monitoring. If, if we've sold stuff for uh, Mexico or Canada, I think even Hawaii, all of those are local recording. So we set them up and they view it. And then they, they might have somebody local that is, is monitoring that. But as far as our responsibilities, the hardware and the setup and the training. And then the follow up on that. And then, you know, we, we don't do that. And before becoming the operations manager? Yep. You were the one also installing those, were you? Correct. So I started with the company um, back in 2001. It's a long time ago, right? Is and um, okay. back then, I actually came in. So that company, um, at that time, they had um, s uh, security guards and then um, live-in security guards. And... Um, one of uh, the supervisors that was working at that time came over to me and said, hey, I need some help. And would you be willing to help? And I, I was already working and um, doing um, uh, pre-wiring for houses. Uh, so I knew a little bit of alarms. Um, and he uh, technically it's security. So he came up to me, a uh, friend of ours. He said, hey, I need some help. Um, and I do need you to come in and do paperwork. And, you know, could you help me for this coming weekend? I said, sure, no problem. So I started out in the company as a weekend actual security guard. Oh, really? Uh, and then from there, I moved up to um, security guard supervisor. And when I was security guard super security guard supervisor, then um, that's when the company as a whole started to think technology. Mm -hmm. said, then they had a big uh, growth in uh, California. And then when it came to Texas, the question was, well, who do we have that has some knowledge on the security side, and somebody threw my name out there. And I, I mean, I didn't interview for it. It's just word of mouth of people that knew mm. what I had done before. And um, and of course, that I was a supervisor and I was actually helping on the guard side. And say, hey, would you be interested in, in learning and expanding the technology side? And I go, sure, why not? I mean, it, it's something new uh, for me to try. And uh, we were starting from the ground up. So we had people coming out to train me, do the work with me, and that's way back. We, we did a lot of hard work before we got to do smart work. Um, and uh, thank God that, you know, throughout the years, uh, I've had the opportunity to learn new technologies and then apply them and get paid for them, mm -hmm. uh, you know, throughout the same same span and, and with the same company. Um, wow. So it's, it's a, it was a long road, but from there, obviously the normal steps would be and, you know, I was found as a security guard. I moved up to supervisor, and then we changed to technology. And from there, I was the first installer in Texas. Oh, really? I was the first installer in Texas. How busy were you? And um, it was pretty. It, it, it was. It wasn't as busy as it was hard because of all the physical stuff. Okay. Back then, you had to put or make a hole in the ground, make the actual uh, hole, put a put a pole. Um, so you would have to do all that? All that. Really? So I would, you know, I would actually call California and say, hey, I need a couple of people or a person at least to help come and help me uh, to start this. And uh, we would just take it from beginning as far as putting the pole, putting the camera, one camera <laughs> running, you know, at 1,500 feet wow. um, through buildings or making a ditch or whatnot, and then going to one trailer. And the only person that would see it would be the guy on that trailer. Right. And that's if he was there. There's no internet. It was just one wire and a recorder. It was very, very high tech. And what year was that? When we did it. That, that was back in 2001, 2002. And how different were the cameras back then from so now? So the cameras back then uh, were analog. So, yes, we, the, the technology that we tried to apply was the PTZ Pant Tilt Zoom. So the camera would be able to move around and zoom in, mm -hmm. but then you needed to record that, obviously, and you needed to see that. And that's where the huge cable and the power um, the power to the camera would come in. We'd have to do all that physical work. So it's not that it was a lot of uh, jobs at the beginning. It was just this, a lot of work because mm -hmm. it took a lot of work for to do one. And the price was high, and people paid it. 
Um, so as far as the margin of return for the company was, was really good because, you know, people were paying for something that we were just coming up as solutions for the clients. So, and that's how everything started to grow. We have a client and they said, hey, uh, well, not hey, Ozzy, hey, you know, the company, would it be possible for you guys to do this? And the company was like, right now we don't do it, but give us three months, give us six months, and then we'll come up with a solution that you guys can pay for. And of course, we'll be able to roll it out as a new product. Um, and as new products started to be added on, um, new technologies came on board, um, and we went away from hardwired all the way up to what we have now, which is a fully standalone um, surveillance system that doesn't need power. And it'll record, what and do you mean you're able to see power? it, and you're able to monitor it. So the, the system is very, very neat. Um, and again, if, if people didn't ask for something like that, then we probably wouldn't be making it, mm -hmm. you, you know, cause you know, we wanted to make sure we put something out there that people wanted to get and we were going to get paid for it. But, uh, so this one came about by, um, all the issues that you can encounter while you're building, you know, a structure or you're, you're building a Walmart or Home Depot. Um, at the beginning, nobody's going to want power. Nobody needs power. They're just breaking ground, right? But that's the same time that you have a lot of critical elements already on the site. You have a lot of metal, you have a lot of wood, you have a lot of uh, tools and everything else. So how do you protect something without power, right? And the solar um, technology came mm -hmm. about and, uh, you know, little by little, we started to test and integrate that into our surveillance systems. And that's how we came about with, you know, our solar mm -hmm. unit, mobile surveillance unit, we call it. Is it also like wireless or Bluetooth? So as, as long as you have the pro appropriate power, you can run a lot of things. Oh, really? So we just wanted to make sure that we had enough of a power uh, bank to um, power up the, the cameras adequately, the recorder ad adequately, and of course, uh, a, a wireless connection. So um, everything's powered with that battery bank. Um, and uh, we protect it in such a way that it, We've got monitoring on the unit. We got monitoring on the cameras. We got monitoring on the client's assets. So all of that really makes it a really good good package, and without power. So we've got um, I got a couple of units that we got picked out or we picked up because it is mostly temporary. So somebody that builds a Walmart um, or Home Depot, they don't need our specific unit from beginning to forever. They just need it from when they you know. The people that were working there are there, and then when they leave, you know, they don't need us. So our leasing system is very good for that, and we just picked up two units in the desert outside of Las Vegas. We drove about an hour, hour and a half. Well, not we. The, te the technician drove about an hour and a half in the middle of nowhere, mm -hmm. and we still had, you know, the capability of seeing it, monitoring it, and acting, you know, on, on the events that were out there. So it was pretty good, pretty good. And then imagine that you guys would have great solar power over there. In Las Vegas, they, they're, they're blessed. <laughs> <laughs> Some people would say, you know, they're going to burn up. And yeah, it's really hot, really hot. But as far as for our systems that are solar powered, they, that's the only thing you manage. So we, we have solar, we have powered um, uh, systems. And in that branch, out of that location, we only have solar requests, solar units. We've never installed it powered unit in that area for wow. I don't know over 15 years <laughs> so for like uh, the unit that you have in Vegas since you're using solar panels how many solar panels does it require to power that up um, there is a certain let's say limitation that we built into our 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 systems and if um, if what we put in it is under you know what the what we can put out as far as power then we're good so it doesn't matter if we put one camera or four cameras it matters how much of each camera um, uh, the power that they draw and then you add everything up and say okay can we run with this power and then you say yes or no so uh, right now that that's what we're working with uh, we do have customer requests that we always say let give us give us some time to calculate whether or not we're going to be able to do it and if we're we where you don't have the power, we'll make a unit that'll be able to do what you want. But then again, it's a, it's a custom job 
and we let them know, hey, we have a little bit more lead time. You're still going to get what you need exactly how you want it. Um, but um, our current uh, hardware, you know, wasn't designed for that. So we have to custom custom make it for them. Mm. Now, going back to you as a security guard, mm -hmm. being a security guard, what, what was your or what was your goal after becoming a security? Were you playing? So believe it or not, um, I was uh, coming out. Actually, it was shortly after I, I came out of the university. And I came out of the university without a degree. I mean, I just got out. It oh, like you dropped out? It, basically. Oh, okay. Um, there were some personal circumstances, but mm. um, I didn't go back. So while that was going on, obviously I was working. And I've always thought about going back and finishing. Okay. Um, and then the university. And the university, but I have never actually finished a um, bachelor's degree. But um, back then, my goal was, okay, I'll learn. And, and I got this, uh, you know, people will hear this a lot from older generations. Hey, learn what you can, right? And uh, then, then you know that you have that knowledge. And then you can, if you want to, you can create a business because you've al already learned. As opposed to, well, you know, go to your job and then turn the wrench when they tell you to turn the wrench. Mm -hmm. No. Right. You go in there and you learn as much as you can, regardless if you're just a security guard. Learn what it takes to be a supervisor. Learn what it takes or learn at least as much as you can see no from, matter from where the you manager, are. no matter where you are. Right. Um, as a security officer, you, you, I had probably like three or four um, instances where I, I talked to the manager. But even then, you can learn. Okay, mm. why is he here? What is he? What is he? What is his goal? And then how he got to that goal, and you, you're there through that process, even though it's two or three times. Um, but my goal at that time was um, to finish school, finish you know university, um, and um, you know probably work in the electronics field. So I wanted to get an electrical engineering degree, and I didn't. Um, but everything that I was doing just, it just felt like that's something that very much interested me and, and it was new technology and it was something that a lot of people didn't know about. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yep, this, this is nice. I'll learn about it. And I really liked my job for when, from when I transitioned from security officer to a technician. That's a, that's yeah. a like a, <laughs> yeah. a completely different. Yes. Change. Yes. It was different. Totally different. Um. As a security officer, you're there, you're watching, you know, for a certain amount of time, and you're doing your reports. As a technician, you're you're not just watching; you're seeing where the problems are going to come, um, that you can only you can solve, right? As a security guard, you, you, they can always replace, you know, your 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 space with somebody else, and they're going to be doing the same thing: observe and report. That's what they're supposed to do: observe and report. As a technician, you use your knowledge to Make sure that that signal gets to the other side properly or that it gets saved or, you know, that um, all the hardware is working. Um, it's just, if, to me, it's, it's not that it was natural. It was just very interesting. And I, you know, I developed it pretty, pretty good. Now, why do you think that when they're looking for that position that they brought up your name? Was it something that you communicated with others as far as what you wanted to do? Or was it the things that you did? Or what, what do you think it was? I would want to think that it was the, the fact that I was willing to help out, you know, the goal. You know, okay. somebody the goal of the company? The goal of the company, the goal of the month, the goal of that job site. So every time that you that I approached a job, I would say, okay, well, what's the goal? I mean, if I'm here, I, I just drove to a location as a security guard. What is the goal? Am I going to watch, uh, watch the front door or am I going to watch the back door? And mm. why am I going to watch the back door? It's so, something so simple, yes. but yeah, it can yeah, lead something such very a, simple. Yeah. So, um, on that end, and they were like, well, you know, at least he's very proactive about, about his job. Right. Uh, not just saying, okay, well, I have to turn a wrench or I have to be in the front and, you, you know, report what's on the front. So you, the fact that I, um, I asked a lot of whys and I actually implemented into my work, that was one, I, I believe. The other one is I, I always like to talk to people that I got to, that I got to meet at work. Um, there's, um, and, and you, you know me, I'm very non-professional <laughs> in the sense of communication. I am very, 
I, I prefer saying, like in Spanish, yeah, prefiero a, a, hablarte en, en vez de hablarle. So it's like it's not as a, an adult to an adult. It's almost like a friend to a oh, friend. Oh, right. In English, there's right. no difference. But in Spanish, right. there is. Like regardless of the other person's position yes. or their status level, it's like you just want to communicate to another yeah. person. Just just as like you said, as a friend. Yeah. Yeah. And then and I think they noticed that. So that translated into us talking to clients. It was very, obviously you, 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 you're you professional, but I was very honest, very sincere. Okay, well, I thought this, I thought that. And um, that's something that they needed to be able to perform a job with very little supervision and your very, your, your closest supervision is states away. You know, I mean, you need to trust that person. You need to know that that person um, has a good attitude, has uh, again, Pro, be uh, proactive um, actions in their work and um, is honest, you know, sincere in what they do. And when you're always um, talking in the, in the professional sense, there's that detachment, yeah. right? So, yes, I said, sir. Yes, yes I said, ma'am. But right. it's not the same right. um, as saying, you know, just going through the motions and then reporting professionally as opposed to talking, talking it through, talking to the client listening to the client um, and, and making sure that the client um, leaves your, your, your talk or your, your moment in, with, with a good attitude, knowing, hey, he listened to me and they're at least going to try to work with, with us for a solution. Right. And, you know, the, the people that really talk to you like as a friend, you can tell that they're honest because they're talking to you the way that you should have a normal conversation. Yeah. You know, when you – hear people talking all professional you're like uh i don't know this guy's trying to sell me something <laughs> that that's the weird part also <laughs> i mean and i noticed that you know uh, uh, being on the, the the client side now i mean obviously when you grow up i would say there's less people looking at themselves as cl uh, as customers um they're more looking at themselves as the person that provides the service mm -hmm. so if you're a waiter you're you're the person providing the service um but the more age you have, the more uh, responsibilities you have. You find yourself noticing how people treat you as a customer and how people either seem like they're going to sell you or they just seem genuinely just trying to give you information so you can, you know, have a better day or choose the right things. Um, and that matters. That matters, right. you know, how, how it is that you approach a relationship, even if it's a, or a conversation. Um, if you're approaching it with, uh, you know, very, very sincere, very sincere way of talking about um, the, the things that you want to sell, because you, you do want to sell, right? But if you're sincere about it and um, right. very open, very transparent Honest. about that, then it should be fine. It should be fine. So. And where do you think you learned or you manufacture those, um, those morals or like being goal oriented and all that? It's going to sound weird, right? Uh-huh. Uh, but I, I have I to like say weird. it. I have to say <laughs> it. So um, growing up, I was a PK. You know what a PK is? A, a PK? So no. some people say pastor's kid. Some oh, people okay. say preacher's kid. Uh-huh. Um, and then, um, you know, but some people say either either you're, you're a PK. You're either mm. really good I never or, heard or of really that bad, too. right? And, and that's PK. Mm. And... Um, I wanted, when I was young, I wanted to stay away. I wanted to really, really detach myself and make myself, uh, let's say, like make my own world. That's right? cool. Because you're, you're growing up, you're growing up in the church, and for me, I wanted to be me. I didn't want to be a PK, right? But every time I left, and this is where the weird part comes up, every time I left, I would always have that um, unfit uh, sentiment, unfit um notion and not in the sense that you might think so the unfit is the i don't fit in mm. so i was like i was doing this i was doing that it was just like it just didn't feel right like i wasn't really supposed to be in that position or doing that thing or going that place it just didn't feel right. so and the only thing that i can think of was that people were you know really really praying for me when i was when i was not i'm not around so uh, we have a big family, 
And I, I would want to say that, it, you know, a lot of people prayed for me because we have a big family. And uh, I was the one that was always going out. It's like, <laughs> hey, guys, I'm going to leave. I'm going to do my own thing. So you were the, yeah. like, was were you like the black sheep of the, black sheep of the family? You, you could say that <laughs> for, for a while. I, I was. Well, you uh, were trying to. You're trying to find yourself, find yeah. your thing, right? Every young person yeah. wants to do that, yes. right? Yes. Every young yes. person is like, yeah, I, I, I want to make my, make a name for myself, right? Right. right. Um, and then you learn, you know, it, hard truths when you're by yourself. Um, but while you, while I was doing that, again, um, you know, my my compass came from um, internally remembering what I was supposed to do. And yes, I would base that on whether or not my My parents uh, uh, prayed for me, and they prayed for me a lot. But it's stuff that they taught me while I was growing up. Mm -hmm. And as a kid, you don't know. My, I have a son, six-year-old, right? He doesn't know that I pray for him every day. He doesn't know that every day I try to do things so that he can remember, and he grows up, and is like, oh, you're not supposed to do that. Well, why aren't you supposed to do that? Well, my dad didn't do that. Right. So I want to show him what you're supposed to do right. in difficult situations. and. You know, every day we find ourselves um, looking back and like, he noticed that. I didn't I didn't even know he right. was paying attention, right? It's like those things that you hope <laughs> yes. he holds on to. Yep. And eventually, I mean, just just like we say, hope, we hope that, you know, that sticks. And mm -hmm. later on, he's able to apply it. Or later on, he's like, you know what? My dad told me this or my dad taught me that. So, yeah. And know, they might not even sense. say it. Like I said, when I was growing right. up and I was making a name for myself, I would have never said, hey, I learned this from my dad. Mm. I learned this from my mom. I never wanted to give them that much credit. Really? Right? Mm -hmm. I never did. Not, not, in, not in that time. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't want to say, I wouldn't want to say that I was rebellious, mm -hmm. but I really wanted to make a name for myself. Right. Um, but looking at it, you know, now uh, it, it was always the fact that I had already instilled in me some things that you, you just, it, they're not right. Right. It, they, you know, it, it was something that um, I, I, I just can't explain. That's that's why that's where the weird part comes in. Right. You know, when you when you grow in such a blessed way that as I did, even though I didn't see it, uh, it makes an impact on your life. And uh, I, I won't be a dad uh, as you and I think that a dad would be um, for a long time. There's going to be a time where little Ozzy grows up and then he's going to be a man. And that time we're going to change roles mm -hmm. as a, you know, everybody knows that, uh, as a parent, uh, if you have, uh, kids, um, the, the roles change. So, uh, I want this part of my life while I'm showing him to be something that he can, uh, internalize. And then later on have that feeling of like, okay, no, this does not feel right. This is this is not not right. So, so yeah. And, and with my dad, it was the same thing. It was when I was growing up, and actually when I, I had a lot of, um, let's say, experiences with my dad, um, in the sense that um, he he was very strong minded, and I was very strong minded. I was mm. I was I was not strong minded. I would say stubborn, <laughs> right? And yeah. um, there came a point in our life that we actually reached a little bit of an equilibrium, right? And it wasn't until adult years where we saw each other and it was like, you know, it's, it's a partner, right? As opposed to, oh, it's my dad, mm -hmm. right? Said, yeah, there, there's no longer that fear. There's like, oh, it's my dad. He's going to come right. and do something. Or he's going to put me on time out. <laughs> <laughs> so it was different. And then now it was respect, you right. know, respect for that. Right. That uh, knowledge that he had imparted to me and all the things that he would say, like, uh, and, and you would say that uh, some in Mexicans, and I would say Mexicans because I'm a Mexican, mm -hmm. Mexicans <laughs> have a tendency <laughs> to always say uh, extra things uh, to their kids. Oh. Don't jump there because you're going to fall or don't do this. Or if you go to that place, make sure you order this and this and this. And I'm like, that's way too much information, right? Right. But, um, It makes sense. You know, right. you, you're always on your kid when he's small and it, it makes sense when they grow up and you're like, hey, you know, now I know what my dad was thinking. Right. When you have a kid. Right. So, and you try to do the same. Right. Just you, you hear it and you really acknowledge it when you're older. 
And but when you're a kid, I mean, you you listen yeah. to those lectures, and I'm, you're just like, man, I can't wait till he stops talking. <laughs> the funny thing is, even though, even though you don't want to listen to the lectures, you're listening to them. Right. So I you find don't, you don't know that you're yes, listening. yes. yeah, you yes. don't know that you're actually paying attention, and you are paying attention. Yes. So. I noticed that with uh, my son, you know, we tell him and it seems like he's like it goes one ear right. and goes out the other. And then a week later, two weeks later, we see the result of the right thing to do for the right reasons. And we're like, I really thought that I blew it when I was talking to him, you know. <laughs> and no, it was something that he, he you know, he learned, you know, from, right. from us as parents. Uh, you can't just think that a kid will know, you know. Even in, a, in an adult, I mean, like when you're 21, you, you can't assume that a 21 year old will know everything. Right. Uh, even though they're they're they've already gone and finished you know, even a university, they they won't know everything. Their no. the brain their brains are still at Developing. a different different level than when you're, you know, 40, 50. Um, so every time that they're they're learning, they they might not even know it. So right. a lot of the learning they do is by looking and and seeing what you know, the people around them are doing. Right. So we want to, you know, as far as kids go, we want to make sure that Ozzy's around an environment that everything is conducing to him doing the right things for the right reasons. Right. So. And you kind of want to let your kid do his own thing to where you're not, like you said, you know, just go in there and do what I'm telling you to do. That's it. It's like, no, you got to let, you know, for as you're as a grown up or as a kid, let them do their own thing. Let them figure it out. Because that yep. eventually applies to the future, you know, just like you, you're like, I don't want to be the same as everybody else. I want to do my own thing. Yep. Because now when you come into a company, if something doesn't make sense, you're going to say, you know what, I'm not going to do that because that just doesn't make sense to me. I'm going to find my own way mm -hmm. that does make, make sense. And, you know, possibly that'll be better not only for yourself, but for everybody else around you, mm -hmm. you know. Um, back to the security thing, because what I just found out was, I mean, what I just noticed was that there's there's also um, like surveillances yep. with no security guards. It's just cameras. Yeah, I, I actually didn't know that you would actually ca catch that. It's, we call it virtual guarding, right? That's crazy. So that's a that's a I guess a, a service that we kind of provide uh, in the sense of uh, if you have your area covered enough, um, you're able to act like a like a guard in a sense you know somebody calls you up and said hey you know i'm leaving the the office and my parking lot is you know on the third level are you guys okay watching me so we're like okay yeah so go through here or you we go we guide them through the actual cameras that we have is um, it by phone or uh through the phone yeah oh call us up and say hey, yeah go ahead and are you you're gonna go through the you know the west elevator and you're like okay well let me make sure we're you're okay and before they get out, I mean, if you notice something, you tell them, hey, just hang on. You know, there's something outside that we need to take care of and before they go out to their car, right? Is this something new because of the whole COVID thing? Or was, was this? We've had back? this before. We've had this before. Again, uh, some of these services are not cheap, right? Mm. But now it makes more sense, you know, doing that yep. um, because there's less and less people at the workplace. Um, and, you know, the parking lot is less and less full. So... When you go in and you go out, it's it's more important now than ever to be secure. And do you need more surveillance when there's less people or more surveillance when there's more people? It depends. It depends on how secure you have your place. Mm. Uh, there's always You're always going to have the need for a normal alarm system that does its job, right? And then aside from that, that's where we come in to try to fill in that void, that middle ground, uh, or that, you know, extremely weird circumstance where only we can try to provide that. And with that, with the virtual security guards, are you able to now see more to where, you know, the security guard was just one in one spot and then if something was going on, you know, on the opposite side, he would have to go run yep. or go on a go-kart and get go to the other side. And mm -hmm. now is there cameras multiple yep. spots? Oh, really? So there, there, you expand the coverage. If you actually have a manned um, location, you expand his coverage. Because, yes, he's going to do whatever he's told to do as far as the, the post orders or the patrol. Uh, but at the same time that he's doing a patrol on the north, there may be something happening on the south. And that's where the camera comes in. 
we get video analytics, we get information out of that, and then we call them and say, hey, you know, I, you might have passed by this location five minutes ago or 10 minutes ago, but we need to check it out again because, you know, we see somebody jumping the fence or, mm. you know, whatnot. Um, so, yeah, you're increasing your, your security, um, um, you know, like coverage and then reducing your risk. Wow. So That's pretty neat. Yeah. And is that still one person or is there multiple people looking at the cameras? So our central station is set up, like I said, certified, UL certified, I think it's UL5 certified, I think that's what they call it. But it's really good in the sense of they follow the guidelines that they're supposed to. So they separate um, the areas and the sites and several people are able to manage that. So, and I haven't been there lately, uh, last time I was there, I don't know, five years ago, four years ago. Um, but there, as, as we grow, uh, then so does the command center, you know, because they want to make sure that everything's covered, everything's coming in, everything's checked. So, yeah. And then I saw that also there's, well, now there seems to be uh, drones everywhere. Are you yep. guys also using drones? We are not currently using drones. We want oh, to. Okay. It's just that right now there's so much. Um, regulations. Regulations. Uh -huh. and, and then so many things that you need to have. You almost, you almost, uh, you're better off not having a drone. Mm. Uh, a lot of drones right now, um, and as you see them uh, pretty pretty much everywhere, in YouTube or in commercials, you'll see a drone shot, right? But mm -hmm. that's more for entertainment. That's more for recording, you know, progress on a job site. It's not necessarily for security. Just imagine having a drone up um, 10 hours a night, right? Uh, you know, how is that going to be powered? Right. And who's going to man it? And how are they going to know that it's safe? So all of those things, again, it's it's good to have regulations. But right now, we, we just don't have, you know, the the affordable technology for us to be able to provide it as a service. It's always going to, right now, I think it takes two people. To oh, be able, really? You know, to legally do it. It takes two people. You have to do a flight plan, flight path plan. You have to submit it. Uh, if you're in areas that are restricted, they have to approve it for the amount that you requested it. Hey, I'm going to be up for there for 30 minutes. And they're either going to say yes or no. They're almost going to treat you like an airplane. Wow. Can I be well, in this airspace for this amount of time? And they'll, they'll either approve it or reject it. Doesn't it also have to be uh, FAA certified? Yeah. So the wow. one of the two people that are, f well, the person that is flying it has to be FAA certified. Oh, really? As a drone pilot. Right. Because it's now considered an aircraft. <laughs> It's considered, a, yeah, un, uh, unmanned uh, aerial uh, vehicle or something like mm -hmm. that, UAV. Um, and uh, at the beginning, which, and at the beginning I mean like two, three years ago, it, they, they took the same test that a pilot would take. Wow. A, a drone, right? <laughs> you think a drone, you're like, oh, it's a toy, right? Right. But there's some sophisticated uh, drones. But even then, a very sophisticated wow. drone is not an airplane, you know, right? You, that's not your thinking. But they, they had the same tests. So really? every year, I think they were meeting um, and to reduce, you know, those things that are just, they don't make sense for a drone uh, pilot to learn. Um, but we still, we're still going to have to keep some of the, um, you know, naming and some of the terminology, some of the words that only pilots will know, right? How to read the weather mm -hmm. in, the, in the weird way that they have it. Right. You, you don't just turn on the weather channel and say, OK, the weather's going to be, you know, 50 miles an hour at this time. No, they, they like they go into what type of clouds mm. and, then, and where the clouds are, how high the clouds are. And That's true. As far as a drone, you don't, you're not reaching 10,000 feet. Right. Right. But you still need to know that. Right. Because, I mean, drones are now becoming more and more popular. Yeah. But, you know, there's those things that we have to take in con into consideration, the weather the wind and everything is that maybe why there's you think that maybe that's why a lot of companies are not also you know investing a whole bunch of money in drones Th i think that's why because right now it's a it's a new technology in the sense for security and, and it's a new technology that they haven't really ironed up the things and in order to do that it's very expensive and you're risking a lot so if you go up there and for whatever reason you're in a space where an airplane whether that be a commercial airplane or a, a personal airplane, it's going to pass by. Forget the damage to the drone. It's the damage to the actual airplane. And what's mm. going to happen once that airplane hits your, your drone? Right. You, know, you don't know if you're going to break a propeller. You don't know if it's going to damage their, their systems. And 
there's a lot of risk involved. And how high, it. how high can drones get up to? No, I, I mean the new technology for the new drones that they're pretty high. Wow. I mean, you got to think that uh, there's a lot of companies that are doing a lot of high tech work, and that's super expensive. So super, super expensive drones, twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollar drones, right? Mm. And they're going to go out pretty, pretty high. Um, I, I really don't know how high they would be going, but our, our drone um, that we were testing, 400 feet, um, again, we wouldn't be able to go over 400 feet right now uh, with a drone. Uh, but 400 feet up uh, on, on something that's not as restricted, like it, very close to an airport, uh, you can do that. And you can, I mean, it's pretty high. You would think that it's not, but it's pretty high when you, when you see the little <laughs> thing go up and you're like, oh. Uh, right. And then whether or not that's going to reach, you know, your monitoring device right. if, if you have one. Um, because before, um, you, you actually didn't have a monitoring. You have a drone and you have a controller and then you just fly it. Right. right? <laughs> and then they added the cameras and then they added the monitor, which would feed, you know, from, from the camera. Wow. Yeah, unless they want to put us in a globe just so that way everything could be, you know, weather controlled. You know what? I think Amazon was testing that, right? So, uh-huh. so they were testing the, the, the not the globe, but like putting putting the certain cities in a bubble. Oh. Where they would get uh, approval to fly certain drones in that area. And then if they wanted to deliver, then they would put in on uh, that drone and then they would deliver to that address, right? Wow. Um, I don't know how far they've gotten yet. I haven't seen them. I mean, you haven't seen commercials, but I, there's definitely testing going on. Sketchy Amazon. Yeah, Amazon. There's other companies, but Amazon right now is the one that uh, that you, you you would know. Like they they got to be doing that. Right? Wow. Yeah. Oh yeah. They have the money. They have yeah. the technology. They yeah. Have the imagine people. if you if you live in a, a a private subdivision, right, and you don't want you know people coming in because you got a gate or as many people you, right. you were like yeah put put us in the pilot program for Amazon wow. bring it down to our doorstep you know with with a drone you know we've got i don't know 1000 homes let's go ahead and do that here wow there's there's people that are they're willing to put themselves through that pilot program right so not only would they be drones going into their cities but they're also their weather would they be controlled right so if if there's rain they're not going to get any rain the, no the 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 thing that they're going to do they still have the planet right Right. Uh, if there's rain, they're they're not going to be getting the delivery. <laughs> they're not. Mm. Um, and if they are, then you they have to agree that that package may be wet. So are you right. okay with your package <laughs> going ten minutes from you know the pickup location to your doorstep? And when it gets there, it, it's wet. It, you know, if it's electronics, I wouldn't want that. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, it looks like things would go that way. As far as drones, because now you nowadays with the whole COVID thing, Mm -hmm. you see a ton of uh, just food deliveries or grocery deliveries out there, you know, and I'm pretty sure as we advance, we're we're making things easier, faster. And right now, the only thing that's out there that would be better and faster than the the car for people would also be drones. Yep. I think, you know that all of this that's coming coming out of COVID, all the new things that we can do or services that have to be provided, because if you want to be in business as, as a supermarket, you have to offer right. the drive up and then they bring your food and then they put it in there. But what if this ends? That service is maybe, right. you know, something that they're going to keep, want to keep, not, not the store, but the customers. They're like, hey, I like this. Right. It was but it's not COVID, but I still like it. it can, can we keep it, right? So there's going to there's gonna be a charge for that. And I, I think that's going to keep on going. It's just whether or not um, it's going to be affordable. I think it's going to be a little bit more more expensive to, to have that if we didn't have COVID, right? Mm-hmm. Now that we have COVID, I mean, the stores have to make it appealing for customers. And they're, right. they're going to you know lower the price as far as, hey, we we actually don't charge you anything. Just tell us we'll, to come out, and we'll come out and put it in the in your trunk. Right. Um, but going forward, I mean, I've already seen companies that they're they're planning to not have the same um, mitigation uh, equipment that they have right now. They're like, okay, we want this, but we don't want it permanent. So give me a solution that I can have for a year. Give me a solution that I can have for two years. They they they're not thinking that it's going to be permanent, but while we might not necessarily need it for medical reasons, we may need it because a customer wants it. 
you know, in the end, that's that's when it keep, that's what's going to keep a service going. So. And how are the live footages or you know the cameras that you guys are looking at during? Was there any during the riots that you guys had to officially look at? Officially, there were no cameras. What? <laughs> Officially, there were no, no, I, officially, I can't talk about that. I would suspect that there's always cameras looking in the areas. I mean, we're not in Seattle. I mean, there, Seattle's a big hotspot. We're not in Minneapolis, definitely not in downtown on those, those two areas. So we wouldn't have any cameras. Uh, but there's other instances where I, would, where I would think that there would be some video of it. But at that point, then it becomes mm -hmm. uh, the responsibility and the property of that person that is getting the service. Um, and then whether or not... Um, the, the authorities involved are, you know, putting subpoena to make sure that they get that. Um, and there's, it's one thing us um, having the responsibility of the recording that information. And it's another thing for us to just freely give it away when there's privacy involved. Right. Um, and, we, and we, you know, most of the time when stuff like that happens, we have uh, times that we monitor times that we don't monitor, like in the, uh, noon, most of the people are there like, hey, I'm working. We're taking care of each other. Why would, you know, Ozzy's company monitor? Uh, and we don't. We don't. So oh, if, okay. if something happens during the day, right. uh, that's just data that's being stored for that particular particular client that doesn't want monitoring during the day. Right. Um, and it's there if needed. And there if needed. Correct. And then if something happens and, you know, there's an inquiry about it, it would have to be from the person that owns that video, so to speak which would be the client. Um, and then, you know, they would be the ones saying, yeah, I have video or this or that, or I saw that car going to that store and crash or whatnot. We get a lot of requests from the, uh, like that um, from clients. Um, and we get some requests from the public, but again, it's not our, you know, it, it, it doesn't belong to us. We provide right. the service, but the person that mm. owns that data, so to speak, is the client. Mm. Okay. And then uh, I know you do a lot of you do a lot of traveling. Is there is there also still nonstop traveling for you during this so, whole pandemic thing? Um, it, believe it or not, we've had a lot more business. Obviously, so, we, we're in security, right? So mm -hmm. you would think yep. that there, there's there's people at work. There's more um, security that you want because you have less people at work, right? Mm -hmm. And you may have going be going to work instead of five days, you're going down three days. And then what's happening with the other two days? Who's going to watch it? Who wants to go and watch it, right? Mm. So if you have a company of 100 people and all of them are allowed to work from home, who's going to want to go to work? They're, they're doing the work at home. Who's going to want to do, you know? So they might alternate and whatnot, but um, that's where, you know, n newer requests are coming in from newer clients. Um, um, constructions where they have to halt if there's a, if there's a big outbreak. And they have to hold and nobody can come in or or partial people can come in or that crew, which maybe 30 people can't come in and do their construction work. Then that delays things. And we we have to step in and say, well, these people usually were working uh, in the morning and on Saturdays. And now there's not going to be anybody there. We definitely need to get security. So th we have a lot of people traveling, um, but they, they're going to go in their vehicles. Right. I fly a lot. But mm -hmm. that's because we do have custom requests that they're like, hey, you know, I know you guys service me in Texas. Can you do this in Kentucky? And they're like, well, we might. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if our company says yes, then um, then I usually go out there and, and do that service. How f how fun is the pro the traveling process now? So uh, uh, very early on, I, I, I learned that it's easier if you're a uh, TSA, you know, TSA pre-check. Mm -hmm. Um, so, um, I got TSA pre-check. So from, you know, from, from years ago, uh, like I would say like four years, five years ago, um, where I started to travel a lot. Um, and now it's easy. It's easy without that much, pe that many people traveling. It's almost as easy as if there's a lot of people traveling mm -hmm. with pre-check. Mm -hmm. So we, when there's a lot of people traveling, even at 5 AM in the morning, there's like hundreds and hundreds of people in line. Right. And I would just go, hey, I'm pre-check, and now I got a smaller line. Mm. Right now, it's now it's like just very, very few people at the airport. Um, it's safer. 
I would I would say that. So if, if people are traveling, yes, you take your precautions. Mm. Uh, but the the airport is safer in the sense of you know medical risk or mm -hmm. disease risk. Um, not safer in the sense of you know terrorists or anything like that. But you know it's safer to fly uh, now than before when you know there are hundreds and hundreds of people, thousands of people going through an airport. Right. Um, now there's less. There's more cleaning. Um, when you travel, you know you there's certain airlines that give you more space. Uh, you wear masks, so I would say it's faster now and it's safer now, health wise. Right. Yeah. It's crazy how you know when this whole thing happened, everybody or a lot of people, uh, you know, realized that now they had to like wash their hands. <laughs> <laughs> That's something funny, right? <laughs> So and you, it's like, yeah, that's something that you're yeah, supposed to. That's something you're supposed to do <laughs> anyway, right? Right. But if if you're following even half the guideline, you know, uh, things from from the CDC or from from medical uh, experts, you're better off. Y even on your normal day activities, right? If they're like, hey, you should wash your hands continuously for 20 seconds. If you wash it for 10 seconds, you're safer or more clean than if you didn't wash it, right? Mm -hmm. Um, if they say, hey, wash it 10 times a day and you wash it five times a day, you're still cleaner than not washing it. Right. right? <laughs> so we have a lot of a lot of healthier people now because yes, of that. That's a good thing. You're yeah. like, oh, well, you know, every year I know around this time I get allergies or I get, um, you know, sickness. I you're get right. at least I, I get the, the flu, flu at least cold. three times or whatnot. And now people are like, I don't get that I'm like why is that well it's because i'm restraining myself from talking to people and whatnot and i'm washing my hands and i'm like right well, if you take away the the human factor you're still washing your hands right you're still making sure that you don't touch your face a lot or do you know a lot of face and finger you know touching right and, and that keeps you healthy you know um so i would suspect coming out of this we're gonna have healthier people because right. of that because they're you know you're you're gonna you know not not just because you think it's right it's because they're telling you hey you got to be safe you got to keep people alive you got to wash your hands right and wash your hands just stay clean so every time i go home take out and I, that's something that uh you know we started doing before but now we do it More. religiously right get home take off your shoes right and you have a space for your shoes and then you can go wash your hands mm -hmm. that's very very easy to do um even um uh, when i get home you know my kid is like comes to hug me like oh Hold on, take off your shoes. Do you wash your hands? <laughs> okay, we're good. We're good. And then, you know, it's fine. Um, does it minimize or does it zero out all the exposure? No, it doesn't. But it, at least you have um, that, that habit, you know, of being clean and uh, being healthier. So. Right. It's like, uh, you know, you'd rather be safe than sorry. Yeah. yeah. You know, and whatever, whatever works for you, as long as, you know, there's some type of cleaning. I mean, you don't have to go to the edge, you know, and go somewhere and just start cleaning the whole place up but i mean as long as as long as there's some type of cleaning you should be okay when you compare what you're what you're what you didn't do right mm. to a hundred percent compliance and then there's that middle ground of what you do yeah you're so you you may be a hundred percent compliant which is fine it's gonna be crazy but it's fine i mean nobody's gonna point out that you're you're doing this a hundred percent that's great um but there's people that, um, for whatever reason, they may not wash their hands, again, 10 times a day. But at the same time, those people or the people that are went to work, they go to the same room, mm -hmm. they come out, they go to the same house, their house, that's the only two places, and then their, their vehicle. Right? right. So if you keep all those three places clean, you're going to work, you didn't interact with anybody, you're on your computer, I mean... What's the mm -hmm. risk of, right. you know, you contracted anything? Very minimal. Um, you might think, well, well, the cleaning crew. But if the cleaning crew knows what to do, they're the ones that are cleaning and disinfecting everything. Mm -hmm. um, so you wash your hands when you're at work. You wash your hands when you're home. And you wash your hands in the middle or when you stop to the gas station. That's four or five times, right? And then everything else is you working or you driving or you being home. That's still cleaner than what you, di you didn't do before. Right. So there's that middle ground that uh, for everybody, it's, it's a choice. How safe do you want to feel and how safe do you think you are whenever you're in the spaces that you are? If you go to work in a cubicle, you're safer than if you go to work 
at a supermarket. Right. And the, right. You, you can tell the difference right there. I know there are extremes, but you can tell the difference right there. Um, so you, everybody has to be smart about what choice they have and what choice they're going to make um, and keeping themselves safe and keeping their family safe. So I, I have that awareness whenever I fly. Nobody's around me. Nobody's uh, coming in and doing a check mark and say, Ozzy, did you do this? Did you do that? <laughs> there are some construction sites that have that. Did you know that? No. They're like, okay, every hour. I have at least, you have to at least check, you know, do a checkpoint and wash your hands, go to the restroom or really? go to the restroom, but definitely wash your hands and then go back to work. And this is a construction site. Um, I don't want to say where, but there are construction sites that do that. Mm. Um, but I don't have that. So when I fly, I'm just conscious. Hey, w what am I doing or where am I going that maybe they're exposing me more to potential threats or can I walk to the east? hallway as opposed to the west hallway where there's going to be less people uh and then when i come home i'm i was i was exposed to less people than than if i didn't think about it or like oh the west hallway is faster i'm going to get to the gate and it's fine or the east hallway is not as fast but there's less people there i can see it so what's my choice i'll just go through here get the same gate add a minute to my walk no problem hmm. it's fine yeah and the construction thing is I don't know. It's kind of tricky because they're always also l like, mm, I mean, they're all always, you know, working outside in the heat, yep. sweating, covered. Yep. Yeah. For for some people, it's it's good that they're doing that because it gives them that five minute breaks. Right. You have to That's get out. True. You have to get down from the third <laughs> floor. You have to come down and wash your hands. That could be that could turn into a little water break. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And of course, you got to go to the restroom. Obviously, it takes, it takes longer. Uh, mm -hmm. But um, for uh, for other people, y they're doing it because it's a guideline. Like mm -hmm. in order to build that building mm -hmm. uh, in that municipality, they had to follow this guideline. And, right. and that's why they did it. Um, I am sure there's no business out there that would voluntarily stop their people every hour to wash their hands. No. They would give them the choice. Hey, here's, you know, six or seven washing stations. And then throughout the day, you can come and wash your hands. Mm -hmm. That that would be the, the normal thing that a business does. It, it, you know, taking it to the extreme and saying, hey, I have one person that I'm paying throughout the whole day just to stand there with a clipboard. You know, Ozzy passed by at one o'clock. Ozzy passed by at two o'clock. Ozzy passed by at three o'clock. I mean, that's that's more like, guidelines from, from the right city, so. right right so from the transition from security guard to where you are now how many years would you say that was well 2001 2020 right mm -hmm. so that's 19 years oh, okay but um the last uh, and and this is another weird thing the last uh i want to say six years I was in the supervisor position above more more than just one branch, more than just Texas, right? Um, and we had people before us that were doing the same job, uh, and they would last a year, a year and a half. Mm -hmm. So when I said yes to that, I was already thinking, okay, well, I, in a year, year and a half, I'm going to look for something else, sure. right? Because uh -huh. that, that was a history. It, it, it was always, mm -hmm. you know, it, it was always like that. And, and everybody had high aspirations for that person coming in and something would happen and that person would be gone. So when they told me, I was like, I'm going to do it because I know it needs to be done. I'm, I'm mm. a team player, right? But I know, you know, in a year and a half, something's going to happen. Either I'm going to screw up or something's <laughs> going to screw up and it's going to be blaming on me. And, and all right, it's fine. It, you know, it's not like I was married to this job, right? Right. But as long what as I, you're going to learn something, as long as I'm going to learn something, I was like, yeah, I'm going to learn, I, you know, I may get some credentials and whatnot. Um, and um, what happened was that year and a half passed by. And, and for me, it was normal work. And then I realized I was like, oh, I'm a little bit past the last guy that was here. Yeah. Right? <laughs> and um, I kept on, you know, thinking to myself, I was like, well, what, why is that? And I right now I still haven't found out why mm. I'm, I'm still there. Uh, <laughs> uh, other than I, I want to make sure that the people above me uh, know that we are doing as much as we can to to work and the people below me know that I'm giving them a, as much uh, freedom to do things, um, get the same result, but in a way that they're comfortable with. 
So I might tell somebody, you know, for example, I might tell somebody, make sure you change the tires on this car, you know, by three o'clock and it's, it's, it's noon. So he has to do it in three hours. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, as long as, you know, the 10 people that I told do it by three, I'm fine. Right. Some person might say, I'm going to use a powered, you know, the power drill and and it takes me 45 minutes. Right. Mm -hmm. And another person might go, well, I need to check the tire. I need to check the air and everything else. All All I told them, all I told them was just change the tires. Right. The result that I would be looking for in the end is their, uh, their standard. Okay. And then how they get there. That's the beauty of, I think the way that we've been doing things right now, how they get there, as long as there's things that are, are checked off, then we're fine. And we meet, you know, at least two, three times a month uh, via, you know, phone or Zoom call or, you know, uh, Ring Central, I think it's called right now. Um, and we, we talk and we say, okay, who had a problem and solved it and want to share? Mm. So I have everybody else learning from that one person that found something new or a, w- a new way to do things. That's cool. And if somebody didn't find it, they're like, okay, well, who has a problem that has reached out and nobody has given you the answer? Well, then they say that in the meeting. And then you get a collective, you know, solution saying, well, have you tried this? Have you tried that? And then as we're doing that, we find that we collaborate and we're more together. So the person in Texas know who's, knows who the person in California is. And after the meeting, if they want to find a solution, they don't have to come through me. They don't have to come through the supervisor or anything mm-hmm. like that. Oh, I, I know Joe from California knows it. Well, I just dial him up. So there's a lot of more togetherness, I think. That, right. That, that's what I or brought. working as a team. Working right. as a team, even though that team is national, right? Mm-hmm. Um, there's a lot more working as a team that I think uh, that wasn't before. So before, mm-hmm. I, you know, right. th- we had a lot of people that were operations managers in that sense, but they they were always – segregating the people oh okay so um i think that's why i'm still here Mm. so let's let's end with that all right goodbye everybody thanks